I recently had someone ask me if I could only play 10 games for the rest of my life, what would they be? I had never really considered such a thing before. I mean, why would I limit myself in such a vast and diverse hobby like video games? Inevitably, it comes down to the traditional hypothetical desert island. You are stranded away from having access to any other games and only have what you brought with you. To further complicate the choices, you can't bring compilations or use emulation. These are standalone choices only. I always consider top 10 lists to be hard enough, especially when you do it on a broader basis and include all platforms. But thinking about this, this is only 10 games total that you can play for the rest of your life. You aren't just having to think about what your favorite games are, but since you can never replace them, replay value becomes perhaps the biggest consideration. You'll need to look past things like graphics and some of your favorites based on nostalgia. These games will need to be more than just fondly remembered action games that you can beat in 20 minutes, but something with a bit more meat on its bones. At first I thought this would mean I'd almost certainly be shooting for RPGs exclusively, but after some thought, I found my list to be quite a bit more diverse. In this episode, we will be taking a look at what games I choose to be stuck with and why I pick them specifically. I hope you guys enjoy my Desert Island games. My first pick would be the 3DO version of Road Rash. Not only am I getting a killer licensed soundtrack from some great bands and one of my favorite games ever, but it also has some pretty robust replay value and challenge. It starts out easy enough, but by the time you hit level 3, the races are longer and much more difficult. By stage 5, each victory is earned through blood, sweat, and tears, and just finishing a race can be considered a triumph. The visceral thrills of this game has always appealed to me. The feeling of the open road is unlike any racer I have ever played. This world is alive and there are cars, pedestrians, road hazards, and countless other things in everyday life out to be a thorn in your side. Tracks have branching paths that offer some choice that can really screw you over. It also has a great sense of urgency about it. There are over a dozen other racers on the track that want to bash your head in and you have to be on guard the entire way to stay in contention. As your bike gets faster, all these things begin to feel even more dangerous. One wrong turn, one poor choice, and bam, you're mowed down by an oncoming car or caught by the police. The funky art and grunge-tastic FMV add an air of surrealness to it all, kind of like a dream within a dream. I choose the 3DO version because of the image quality and sound. While there are better running versions of this game, none sound as good as this one, particularly the engine noises. Different characters allow you to give an identity to your rider and the save option allows you to keep that rider going as long as you want. Music videos while the controller is idle just adds icing to an already killer package. No doubt about it, if I had to choose something to play regularly, this would be at the top of the list. I've always enjoyed a good golf game, but there is something about Neo Turf Masters that really appealed to me on a pretty profound level. It's instantly accessible and easy to pick up. There aren't a bunch of screens that overwhelm you with stats, just pick a golfer, pick a course, and off you go. The mechanics couldn't be easier. Each club is listed with a rough distance you'll get with a solid hit, minimizing the guesswork. You can put a spin on the ball to get it to go left or right more, but even that's set up so you can get a feel for it after only a few tries. Soon you'll be nailing birdies and eagles regularly. That may lead you to believe that Neo Turf Masters is an easy game, but it's really not. On the higher difficulties, the other golfers shoot near flawless, so it doesn't take but a few errors to ruin your game. It was set up in the arcade to eat your quarters to see a full match playthrough, so you have to contend with penalties should your play not be up to snuff. Neo Turf Masters is also a great looking title in a sea of average contenders. Before the rise of polygons, golf games tended to be simple looking affairs that rarely grabbed you visually. 
Here you get great color and detail, superb animation, and some nice transitional scenes in between holes. I even love the music. It's a mix of upbeat and relaxed tunes that really puts you in the mood to play. The entire package just never gets old and I can play it non-stop for hours at a time all these years later. There's a lot of old sports games out there that hold up well, but when it comes to presentation, replay value, and overall fun factor, Neo Turf Masters is a hole in one. There are games that come along that really grab you from the moment you pick up the controller. They offer something so profoundly new or refined that you just can't help but to be enthralled. Super Mario 64 was one such title for me. To see Nintendo's mustachioed mascot go from his simple 2D antics on the NES and Super NES to this was a revelation that 3D gaming really was capable of some truly great strides in gameplay. All of a sudden, Mario's flat world of pipes, Goombas, turtles, and piranha plants was burst wide open, and what had once been mere decorations were now part of an obstacle course of fun. Trees you could climb, cannons that could blast you skyward, hills and mountains that could be scaled to the very top, volcanoes, Egyptian temples, and sunken ships that could be explored both inside and out. And while all that was impressive in its own right, it was the gameplay that really brought it all together. Mario could always run and jump with the best of them, but here the little dude was an acrobatic marvel. He can launch himself into long jumps, cartwheel on demand, crawl, backflip, swim, fly, climb, and slide all in 3D. The analog control was flawless and made games like Tomb Raider seem like mechanical nightmares in comparison. Mario's world was also a triumph of graphical excellence. Aside from running great, it also looked like a place Mario had visited before in his many adventures. Even the abstract stages that were little more than obstacle courses hanging in mid-air still had a great sense of creativity to them. The appeal of this universe was not lost in the transition to 3D, creating a magical journey that made it unforgettable. Sega created a lot of games that I love to death, but when it comes to raw replay value, Dragon Force sets so far apart from the rest of that list, it's not even funny. This is the type of game that benefits from your creativity. How you play it determines how much fun it has or how much challenge it presents. Your basic mission is to take one of the playable kingdoms and conquer the land of Legendra. The other monarchs won't go quietly, so you'll need to storm their lands and show them it's your way or the highway. Battles play out on the field of up to 200 combatants, plus the magic each general is capable of. You have a choice of recruiting defeated generals to your cause or leaving them locked up in jail. You have a choice of which kingdom to battle first and in what order. You have options of choosing your troop types, who you send into battle, and equipping your generals with all the best weapons and armor. You really can play it however you want, and with some creativity, you can make this so difficult and so fun, a single playthrough can last hundreds of hours. Combined with the impressive audio and visual presentation, this is a must-own in a situation like this. It's got the replay value of choice and multiple kingdoms, not to mention a battle system that really holds up for multiple playthroughs. High-level play can be something to see with fully upgraded generals blasting magic attacks with 200 soldiers on the field. It's easily one of Sega's best games.
It's easy to look at OutRun 2 and label it a simple racing game. I mean, there are other cars, a time limit, and a course to get from point A to point B. All the staples of an arcade racer. But I like to classify OutRun 2 as a relaxation simulator. The feeling it gives you driving across the landmark latent areas is therapeutic by design. This is meant to capture the joy of being on the road, behind the wheel of a speed demon that whips you around turns like they're not even there. Nothing about this is realistic and it makes no effort to do so. This is all about speed and scenery, or to put it another way, the thrill of going really fast in some really pretty places. Traffic represents obstacles for you to deal with but never offer anything more than the odd nuisance. Your real challenge here is keeping your speed up, not the other cars are coming in first place. You also have multiple routes you can take so you can see different combinations of the areas on each trip. You get different models of Ferraris to drive, and there are other modes to test your drifting and driving skills. I tend to prefer the original Xbox version of OutRun 2, but there is an updated version called OutRun 2006, coast to coast on the various platforms, that is just as fun. Of all the arcade racing games that have blessed the halls of gaming history, this one takes a back seat to none of them. As I've gotten older, I've come to enjoy games that give me a living, breathing world to explore. Being a big fan of Wild West movies, the draw to Red Dead Redemption 2 is immediate and absolute. It's set in 1899, right at the turn of the century in the Midwestern United States. The days of living free on the land at your discretion is coming to an end, and your way of life is being threatened by multiple forces around you. I enjoyed the story and how things played out, but what really hooked me in this was the ability to live in the world without paying any attention to the story whatsoever. You can be a law-abiding citizen, hunting big game, helping the locals, collecting bounties on criminals, and even just exploring the massive map to see what you can find. But you can also be a monster, a murdering, marauding bandit that preys on the strong and weak alike. It's all up to you. I've wasted countless hours here just fishing the streams and lakes of this world. Hours more hunting the rare creatures that inhabit it. I've been a wild horse tamer, a train robber, and even a peacemaker. There's so much to see and do. So many people to interact with. So many lives you can lead. Of course, it also benefits from an impressive graphics engine. Mountains, forests, swamps, cities, and everything in between are well represented here. It ties this experience together perfectly, resulting in one of my favorite games ever. For raw replayability, it's something special. You want to start trouble, take it someplace else. I was always a big fan of the Metal Gear games. All the way back to the first time I played it on the NES, I was hooked on its crazy story and colorful characters. When Metal Gear Solid 5 came along, I was ready for more. Thing is, it was the characters and story I ended up caring nothing about. Here it was the open world that commanded all of my attention. Being dropped into the battlefield and being able to take out enemy troops any way I saw fit was incredibly enticing and the better I got, the more risks and challenges I sought to explore. Instead of going in loaded to the brim with weapons, I'd go in with nothing and see if I could defeat the enemy with pure stealth tactics and takedowns. Sometimes I even wanted to go in guns blazing for a full-on firefight to see if I could survive against ridiculous odds. The choice was mine and the heart of what this one is all about. There's other components here to explore like base building, buying weapons, upgrading your equipment, and so on, but all of that takes a back seat to the combat simulation elements. There are almost endless possibilities for traps, ambushes, night raids, and long-range combat. Your options are only limited by your creativity. 
The story is there if you want a little more to do, but you'll keep coming back to this for its deep and varied gameplay. I was a big wrestling fan up until about my mid-twenties. I loved seeing the creation of some of the WWE's most celebrated performers like The Rock, Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Undertaker, Triple H, and many others. Over the years, there were many great video games with these characters, but none more replayable than WWF No Mercy for the Nintendo 64. Here you can modify just about everything. The wrestlers, their moves, and even the events themselves. You can build a stable from the ground up to give it countless new personalities and moves to give them life. Matches can be simple one-on-one -on -one affairs or you can go big in cages, beat the hell out of one another with ladders, and even take part in a huge battle royal. Surviving on the harder difficulties is no joke and you'll need some serious time to understand the best tactics. The grappling system here is second to none. It feels so natural and pairs so well with the many moves you are capable of pulling off. There's almost nothing you can't do. Top rope suplexes, diving out of the ring, and even using steel chairs and trash cans to gain the edge. Seeing your guys walk out with a championship is so cool and holding on to that championship leads to hours of replayability. The visuals have aged quite a bit, but the gameplay is so fundamentally perfect you won't care. There was a time when the WWF was on fire, and this game captures it top to bottom. I'm not sure if I've discussed my love of Diablo before, but I have been a big fan since the original PC release back in the 1990s. Battling monsters and looting their dead corpses has been a favorite pastime of mine for years since. Of those games, Diablo 2 is still the best. It was so much fun to go into the wilderness looking for treasure while staring down reanimated skeletons, corpses, giant spiders, and other demonic foes. The setting was incredible. Seeing the ruined towns, monasteries, and crypts of that world really sent chills down my spine. And man, was it cool to find the harder bosses in their lairs, ready to pounce and kill you on sight. The story and interesting characters built a strong foundation for its exploration and battle systems. Each new character brought with it a randomly generated world and you could build their powers and attacks as you saw fit. You could even build a hardcore character that once killed could not be resurrected, adding a challenge element that made you play it entirely different. The excitement of seeing a rare piece of armor or weapon drop made the entire trip worth it. Whether it's the original PC release or the modern remake, I definitely want this one with me. It's got the staying power most games can only dream of. Much like Red Dead Redemption 2, The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim gives you an open world that you can literally live in if you choose to do so. But this one differs by giving you a much more fantastical environment. Instead of the more realistic life of the Old West, this gives you dragons, giants, magic, and a ton of other fantasy elements to mess around with. The lush, gorgeous world is loaded with areas to explore, places to loot, and storylines to discover. You can go completely off rails and do your own thing away from the central narrative, spending hours meeting new people and slaying the many bad guys out to get you. The level progression and creation systems really are interesting. You can build your hero or villain any way you want. 
Whether it's martial might or magic, you can be what you desire, and there are even subcategories and disciplines to look at. Once you decide it's time to pick sides among those that want to rule Skyrim, you have even more choice there. These kinds of games have actually become my favorite among the modern releases. It's true you can have some real fun beating down monsters in God of War, or swinging across the city skyline in Spider-Man, but here you can do what you want when you want. You can be the hero or the bad guy. You can follow the path in front of you, or you can choose not to take it at all, and still spend countless hours with things to do. It's a monster of a game that never fails to keep my attention. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. Sorry, this isn't what I want. I'm sorry, this isn't what I want. This episode could easily be renamed Games That Have The Most Replay Value, but I decided to put a fun spin on it so you could see some of the software that I have played the most over the years. All of these titles has seen hundreds of hours of my time, and I break them out every so often to start a new journey to see even more. I think a short game can still be great, but it's a special thing to have a game hook you with so much to see and do that you keep coming back to it years later. Sometimes it's not just discovery that drives you to replay software, but just the genuine uniqueness in its gameplay. Sometimes just the feeling a game gives you is so potently good, nothing else can replace it. Looking at a list like this from a standpoint of raw replayability definitely has an effect on your choices as well. You will tend to exclude those games that don't have a large amount of content, no matter how great they may be otherwise. Of course, that may just be me, and I'd love to hear what you all would consider for your own list. I'm Sega Lord X. thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.